So the session is being recorded now, so I'm glad to introduce Cristobal Rovira Kaltwasser, who is professor at Diego Portales University in Santiago de Chile, who is one of the leading scholars in the field of populism. So thanks very much for taking the time to speak with me and also indirectly to students at Queen Mary. Uh, one of the key readings on the read list is your article with Gus Müller in Government and Opposition from 2013, which is titled Exclusionary versus Inclusionary Populism, Comparing Contemporary Europe and Latin America. And this is the article I'd like to discuss with you. Um, and before we move to the key arguments of the article, I'd like to ask about your approach to populism, which is something that the students and I have discussed in the previous week. So different academic approach to populism. And it's become clear that you're one of the uh, proponents of what has become known as the ideational approach to populism, um, which sees populism as a set of ideas revolving around the people and the elite. So uh, the students already know what, what, what it means uh, from the past uh, weeks. Could you, you also do it in the article actually, but could you explain in some sentences what you think are the advantages of this particular approach to populism? Also when you compare yes. it with other approaches. Yes, many thanks, Stein, for the invitation. I'm happy to share my thoughts with you and your students. Uh, regarding your question, uh, to put it very shortly, I would say there are two major advantages of the ideational approach. The first advantage is uh, we are working in this paper, but also with CAS, when we talk about the ideational definition, we are following the work of Giovanni Sartori. And we say that to develop clear concepts, particularly in comparative politics, the best way ahead is to work with minimal definitions. And as you have seen in that paper, we proposed a very short definition. It had very little components. The advantage of that is we are able then to distinguish populism from other phenomena. But of course, following Sartori, we say that to analyze clear cases or empirical cases in the reality, we need to add something to that sort of minimal definition. And this is why at the end of the day, Populism in its pure form doesn't exist. What normally exists is subtypes of populism, and this is why in this paper we advance this argument about two different subtypes, inclusionary populism, that in theory is more common in Europe, and exclusionary populism, that in theory it's more common in Latin America. So I think this is the first advantage. The second advantage is that the minimal approach that we develop there, it's very helpful for undertaking empirical research in the sense that we are able to undertake research on the demand side of populism and the supply side of populism. So the supply side of populism is what we do in that paper, or also, for example, what you have done in your own book, in which we try to distinguish who are the political actors that are developing the populist set of ideas. And there, there are different methodological tools that we can use for undertaking that sort of distinction between populist actors and non-populist actors. But we can also analyze the demand side, and this means through surveys mainly, trying to understand who are the citizens that believe, that do really believe in the populist set of ideas, and then try to find differences between those who believe in the populist set of ideas and those who don't believe in the populist set of ideas. And I do think that you cannot do this sort of empirical research with the other definitions of populism. Yeah, so, and this uh, this distinction between supply and demand also comes back in my module. And at this part of the module, we're still indeed very much focusing on uh, on the supply side, so the politicians and right. actors, and, and later we move to, to individuals and supporters of, of populism, yeah. So you mentioned that one of the advantages is it's, uh, you can apply it, this approach very, very well to empirical research and indeed for comparing Latin America and, and Europe, as you do in this article, and you already mentioned that Europe is more characterized by exclusionary populism and Latin America by inclusionary populism. Could you explain the difference between these two forms of populism? Yes, I mean, what we mentioned then in our paper is that following Sartori, as I mentioned before, populism is something very abstract, but in reality normally goes together with something else, with what we normally call a host ideology. And if we look at the contemporary world, what we mentioned in that paper is that we can identify two different subtypes of populism, the inclusionary version and the exclusionary version. The inclusionary version of populism, it's a combination of populism with something else, and that something else is a reinterpretation of socialism. And then if you bring together populism and this reinterpretation of socialism, you will have an inclusionary form of populism. 
By contrast, the exclusionary form of populism is the combination of populism with something else, and this something else is mainly nativism. And because of that, you have another type of populism that is much more to the right-wing spectrum. And if you go a bit deeper into the distinction between inclusionary and exclusionary, we say there are three different dimensions, which are the material dimension, the political dimension, and the symbolic dimension. And in the paper, then, we analyze different prototypical cases to grasp how these material, political, and symbolic dimensions are indeed quite different between the inclusionary dimension and the exclusionary dimensions. Nevertheless, something that we also mentioned there is that it's not really black and white, because of course all the inclusionary forms of populism to a certain extent do exclude certain people, and the same happens in the other direction. So exclusionary forms of populism also are able to include some sectors of society that mainly at a subjective level feel they're not properly include into the political system. And this, of course, has to do with this nativist dimension. And this is why, at the end of the day, they try to mobilize certain sectors of society that are normally mentioned as the losers of globalization, so to say, particularly if we think about the European context. Yeah, it's uh, one possible criticism which some um, scholars, some of our colleagues have also uh, ventilated is that one of the characteristics of Mudder's definition, which you use, uh, says that populists uh, speak of the people as a homogenous group. So populists are inherently anti-pluralist. So doesn't that also mean that in effect all populists are in fact exclusionary and that they cannot be inclusionary? Or what would you sort of reply to such a claim? It's an interesting question and it's an interesting debate. I would say that populists, at the end of the day, independently if they are right-wingers or left-wingers, they do have a very peculiar understanding of how society works. And this is based on this moral and Manichaean distinction between the elite versus the people. And because of that, I do think that it's always like an exclusionary tendency within all forms of populism. Because if you think that society is just a distinction between the elite and the people, and the elite is bad and the people is good, this means that at the end of the day, you want to exclude the elite. So it might be that this is only the 1%, but you are developing at the end of the day a sort of exclusionary understanding of how society should work. So if I put it bluntly, if we kick off, if I'm the populist, yes. And I would say, if we just kick out this 1%, then we have a proper society. And this is, at the end of the day, an exclusionary understanding. If you are a pluralist, your understanding of society is completely different. Because you will say, society is not divided between the people versus the elite. Society is very complex, and you have different individuals, different groups. The elite, as such, it's very heterogeneous. You have like different actors within there. So you have another understanding of how society functions. And this is why, at the end of the day, I do believe that this exclusionary tendency is always there or is part of the populist set of ideas. Yeah, that's very clear. And this also links into a different question, which we will also discuss, but further along in the module. But since I have you on board at, at this moment, I, I, I can't resist the temptation to already uh, ask about that. So what about the implications of populism for democracy? Because these concepts are often linked to one another. And populism is often seen as a threat to populism, to democracy. Um, and if you think about exclusionary and inclusionary populism, it kind of sounds that exclusionary populism is probably uh, worse for democracy or, or more of a threat because exclusionary uh, yeah, it sounds more threatening and it excludes non-native elements, etc. Would you say that's correct, that exclusionary populism is, is more a danger to democracy or, or a potential threat? Well, I think that reality is a bit more complex. And we do say at the end of the article, indeed, that we should be careful with how we understand the relationship between populism and democracy. I would say that it would be a mistake to assume that left-wing version or exclusionary forms of populism are good, whereas exclusionary or right-wing versions of populism are bad. I think that reality is much more complex. And my favorite example, probably your students know that, but if you think about populist radical right parties in Western Europe, the most voted populist radical right party in Western Europe is in Switzerland, Schweizerische Volkspartei, roughly 30 to 35% of the voters in Switzerland are in favor of that party. 
And democracy in, Twi in Switzerland is working pretty well. So, so this is just one example. Of course, you cannot do from one example a, a general law, so to say. But again, I think the situation is much more complex about how populism can have an impact on democracy in different ways. And even if we look at Latin America, the, the wave of left-wing populist forces or ex ex inclusionary populist forces, some of them had had very, very negative impact on the democratic system. I mean, Venezuela is a clear example of that. Of course, it's true that in the case of Bolivia, for example, with the Morales is different. And I would say his, the relations have did, he had with democracy is still complicated, but it's not as bad as in the case of Venezuela. So to make a long story short, we need to undertake empirical research to, to, to answer your question properly. And I don't think that it's black and white. I don't think that one type of populism is always good and the other type of populism is always bad. So there are a lot of differences between different case studies. So we we've sort of talked about the potential threats of populism. Mainly, what, could you could could you sort of repeat what are the potential good sides of populism, or are there certain benefits that the populism brings? Yes, I think the benefit that for me it's 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 very clear, and this I think matters for the two cases for exclusionary and inclusionary forms of populism has to do with the mobilization of sectors of society that for different reasons feel themselves excluded. In fact, if we know the literature on political science, we are complaining that people don't participate in elections. And we know that turnout has been going down in most countries all over the world. But when you have populist actors, what normally happens, again, it's not a law, but in many cases, what happens is sectors of societies that feel excluded start to participate in the political systems. And I do think that this is good news. The democracy needs that the people get involved into the political discussion. And for example, in the case of Europe, this means that many people are saying we don't want more immigrants. This doesn't mean that, of course, you, you have to close borders and do all what they want. But I think it's good for democracy to have a proper debate about how to deal with this topic. And in this sense, this is just one example of why populism sometimes can have this positive effect in the sense of mobilizing sectors of society that feel excluded from the political debate. And part of this, that there's a little bit of this in the article, but you also edited the book with, with Gus Mudde about this more, uh, more yeah, extensive book on, on this particular question. Is populism a threat or, or a corrective to democracy? So I can also recommend that to my students. Uh, the, the final part, the final question that I had or the topic that I'd like to discuss is about what's currently happening. This article is from, it's already seven years old, time, time flies. And you notice also somewhere that this inclusive versus exclusive distinction between Latin America on the one hand and Europe on the other hand, that that's not necessarily stable, that we've also seen different types of, of populism uh, occur in Latin America throughout time. So would you say your main conclusions, especially this distinction between exclusionary and inclusionary, does that still hold? For instance, when we look at, uh, at the election of President uh, Bolsonaro in, in Brazil a few years ago, he's often seen as sort of the Trump of Latin America, often seen as a right-wing populist. Uh, do we see sort of a shift? Does, does uh, populism in Latin America become less inclusionary, if you like? It's a good question, and it's related to what you mentioned at the beginning of the question, that the, the, the paper is seven, eight years old now. So, in fact, it has been published 2013, but this means that it was written probably 2011, so it's almost 10 years ago. And a lot of things have happened in the last few years. Even if you think just about Europe, I will go back to Latin America, but if you think about Europe, there was the Great Recession then, and this implied that a new types of left-wing populist forces appear in the case of Spain, very clear with Podemos, in the case of Greece with Syriza. And I do think that in Europe, there are certain examples of inclusionary types of populism, Syriza, Podemos, even the link in Germany, you come from the Netherlands. In fact, in the Netherlands, it's a socialist party that is normally considered also as an example of inclusionary populism. But I still think that the main argument holds true. If you think about populism in Western Europe, it's mainly the, in, the exclusionary force of populism that are more stable and are able to get more uh, power in elections. This doesn't mean that the, ex, that the inclusionary form doesn't exist. It's there. But I think it's the exception rather than the rule. If we travel now back to Latin America, what has happened in Latin America is that the, the left-wing populist forces 
all of them are out of power now. So the case of Ecuador, it's out of power. The case of Bolivia, it's out of power. We only have Maduro, but this is a dictatorship nowadays, so we don't have really uh, free and fair elections there. So the so-called inclusionary forces in Latin America have disappeared, and we have now Bolsonaro. So Bolsonaro is a tricky example, and I do think that it's the exception rather than the rule in Latin America. And I think that the rise of Bolsonaro has to do with certain specific circumstances that are present in Brazil, but not necessarily all over Latin America. And there are just two pieces of evidence that if you want, I can share you afterward and you can present to your students to, to support the argument that I want to develop. The first argument has to do with the economic development in the country. And just before Bolsonaro came to power, there was a huge economic recession in Brazil. So GDP went down almost 4% in 2015 and in 2016. This means two consecutive years of a deep economic recession, and this generated a lot of anger within Brazilian society. On the top of that, there was a huge corruption scandal that again generate a lot of anxiety and a lot of anger within society and the third aspect that i think that's extremely important has to do with support for democracy and this is bad news for for brazilian democracy if you take the typical question so whether people approve the democratic system or not the amount of people that are indifferent towards democracy in brazil has been going up and then you see the rise of bolsonaro but going back to your question, it's the constellation of economic recession. Then you add to these huge corruption scandals, and then you add declining support for democracy, and then you have Bolsonaro. And these three components, I think it's a very Brazilian story. We don't necessarily see the same issues happening in other countries of Latin America. This is why I do think that for me, it's not very clear that we will see more Bolsonaros all over Latin America. Again, I think it's focused mainly in Brazil, and we'll see what happens in the near future because of the pandemic, because this is a new crisis that's evolving, and that might generate a new political opportunity structure, both for Latin America and Europe, but this is an ongoing issue. I see, yes. And would you say that Bolsonaro is actually an example of the populist radical right and comparable to the cases that you've described in, in Europe, also in terms of the, the issues that he addresses? Is immigration, for instance, also a theme, or is it quite different? Well, I would say that's yes, but. I mean, probably you have seen with your students the definition of Casmude of populist radical right parties, which are characterized by politicizing three different set of ideas, so populism, nativism, and authoritarianism. If you consider these three ideological tenets as the main issues that the populist radical right tries to politicize, in the case of Bolsonaro, it's very clear that he's a populist, and it's very clear that he's an authoritarian. But the issue of nativism, it's less present. I mean, he's also a nativist, but I would say, first of all, he's an authoritarian. Secondly, he's a populist. And third, he's a nativist. And if you go to Europe, it's a bit the other way around. I think that mainly in Europe, there are mainly nativists. Probably then there are authoritarian, and then there are populists. So the way in which these three ideological settings operate in Europe are a bit different than the case of Bolsonaro. But going back to your question, I think that he fits the definition, but it's a bit different. And the other aspect that it's very different has to do with the welfare. We know that, and in fact, you have written about that, that in the case of Europe, populist radical right forces tend to be welfare chauvinists, that they are in favor of the welfare state, but only for the native population. Bolsonaro is anything but a welfare chauvinist. I mean, he's a neoliberal. He really wants to open up the economy, to privatize, to get rid of the state, etc. And this is a key distinction between the, the, the populist radical right forces, I would say, in Europe and in, in the Americas in general. In fact, Trump is more similar to Bolsonaro in this sense than to Marine Le Pen or to Gerd Wilders. So even if you can classify them in the same kind of category, like populist radical right, there's still these differences across uh, across right. continents. Right. So a final question, because um, I have to be conscious of, of, of the time, also your time, obviously. Uh, uh, you, you just told me you were working actually on a special issue on populism and the corona crisis, which is now currently obviously a very hot topic. Um, what kind of impact do you think 
that has it's a very it's a million dollar question obviously on populism yeah. is, it, is it is it a bad thing for populism or or maybe a, a, a potential driver of future populism yeah. well my answer probably it's a bit disappointing in the sense that i think it's not clear but this is exactly what i want to do i think there are many academics and, and also not only academic journalists that started when the corona crisis started to say oh now it's game over for populist for the populist radical right because we are seeing that bolsonaro is dealing very badly with the crisis and trump is dealing very badly approval ratings are going down and this means that now the populist radical right will disappear but i think this is way too simple i think reality is more complex in fact if you look at the case of bolsonaro and the case of 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 Trump, it's very clear that they have dealt very, very badly with the crisis. But if you look at Orban and Erdogan, the situation is quite different. And in fact, the numbers there are not as bad as in the US and in Brazil. So just from this broadly comparison of the four cases, it's just to show that in some cases, they're dealing very badly with the crisis. In some cases, they're not dealing that bad. But the second aspect that I think it's more important is to think about the mid and long-term consequences of the corona crisis. It might be that in the short term, this represents a big challenge for the populist radical right, but it could be that in the mean and the long term, they are going to reframe the crisis in a way in which they present themselves as the savior, so to say, or they're going to criticize the elites if populist radical right parties are in, in opposition. So this is something else that we are considering in this special issue. It's very important to think about a populist radical right party in government versus a populist radical right party in opposition. So, but to make a long story short, I think it's a complex matter and it's very difficult to say there is only one way ahead and Corona means the dead of populism or the other way around. There are going to be differences between cases and countries. That's like how it is in social science in general. It's, it's always complicated. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Cristobal. I think this was great and I think the students will, will really appreciate this, uh, this conversation also and your insights.